August 28. In the year 1943, the game Whack-A-Mole, where you try to predict where a mole will pop up randomly out of one of seven holes so that you can thump it back into its hole with a rubber mallet, is 32 years away from being invented. Invented or not, that game is perhaps one of the better ways to describe the United Nations Alliance task when trying to destroy the German war industry. Except. The Alliance is not even trying to whack the right moles, because the Nazis are taking their moles underground and not letting them pop back up. There, in the permanent darkness, the moles, the German war industry, will feed on the dying corpses of their slaves. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olsen. Last week, we saw how the British are to be made aware of the Bengal famine through a photography series depicting victims in Calcutta. More photos of the series will be published at the end of this week. The last of Thessaloniki's Jews arrived in Auschwitz-Birkenau in a 19th and final transport, the majority gassed on arrival. In Poland, SS and Nazi police liquidated the Bialystok ghetto, deporting thousands to the death factory Treblinka and thousands more to Auschwitz and Theresienstadt into slavery despite that the Jews of the ghetto fought back, only 100 of them managing to get out alive. At the Quebec conference, which ends this week on the 24th, leaders from Great Britain, the US and Canada reiterated the Point Blank Directive, ordering the Royal Air Force and the US Army Air Force to focus their attention on German aircraft production facilities. Raids by the US forces on Regensburg and Schweinfurt followed. Although until recently refusing the directive, RAF Bomber Command's head Arthur Harris sent his bombers out to hit the German rocket production facilities at Peenemünde. This week, Harris turns his attention back into bombing Germany into submission by targeting its cities and civilians. He has his arrows pointed at Berlin. Despite the priorities agreed in Quebec, Marshal of the Royal Air Force Charles Portal seems to agree that that method might work. From Quebec, Portal messages Harris. Attacks on Berlin on anything like Hamburg scale must have enormous effect on Germany as a whole. Early in the night of August 24th, 727 aircraft carrying 1,812 tons of bombs, half of which incendiaries, depart from British airfields toward Berlin. The de Havilland mosquitoes leading them to target failed to locate Berlin's city center, erroneously marking the southern suburbs of the German capital. With the impossibility to target anything precisely, the bombers still managed to hit the city center, including Wilhelmstraße, home to, among other things, the SS Main Security Office, the SS Intelligence Services, and synonymous in German parlance of the Reich to Downing Street, or the White House, due to its location in the middle of the most government buildings. When they fly away, there isn't a single building on that street that's undamaged. The RAF meets fierce resistance from air-to-air -air and ground-to-air defenses, losing 7.6% of their initial force, with 298 aircrew killed and 117 taken prisoner. Despite errors and heavy losses, 2,611 buildings have been destroyed or badly damaged, many of them in industrial areas like the Mariendorf and Tempelhof, 854 out of which 684 civilians are killed many of them having failed to seek the protection of air raid shelters to the frustration of Reichspropaganda Minister and Gauleiter of Berlin, Josef Goebbels, who immediately orders harsher methods to be used to make sure people take shelter in the future. There are further measures taken by the Nazi leadership to tighten the German civilian reaction to the United Nations Allied bombing campaign. The Reichsinnenminister, Reich Minister of the Interior, Wilhelm Frick, has had a cool relationship to the German Führer Adolf Hitler since 1940. They've had very few direct dealings since that year. Frick opposes the Führer's anarchic leadership style based on prescriptive meritocracy, deliberately conflicting areas of responsibility, and social Darwinist competitive environment administration. Despite that Frick is a dedicated hardline Nazi himself, having implemented much of the legal basis of Nazi atrocities, including the T4 euthanasia program on which the extermination factories base their method for murder, other Nazi hardliners like Hitler and Goebbels see him as ineffectual and too theoretical. When pondering the negative public reaction to increased bombing in April of this year, Goebbels noted in his diary, 
These problems are all the more acute in view of that we are undoubtedly lacking a pragmatic central leadership. In my view, and according to my principles, to install such leadership requires a number of personnel changes. Tabofin is therefore right when he opines that instead of Selte, Ley should be labor minister, and instead of Frick, Himmler, minister of the interior. The recent SS reports on dissatisfaction with the Nazis' handling of the war seem to have delivered the final straw, and on August 20th, Frick was sacked. Frick remains as a Reich minister without portfolio, and on August 24th he is appointed as the new protector of Bohemia and Moravia, putting the Czech people at the disposal of yet another butcher of Prague. The same day, Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler assumes Frick's duties in addition to his own and is named General Plenipotentiary for Administration. If the expansion of Himmler's role will provide the Führer with a more consequential leader of the interior acting in his name is, however, doubtful. While he remains fully dedicated and persistent in the genocidal mania he is leading, there is a little bit of evidence that Himmler himself has lost some of his unwavering faith in the Führer. Based on meeting notes that pass over Himmler's desk this week, we know that he is aware of the conspiracy against Hitler by ex-head of the Wehrmacht Ludwig Beck, which resulted in three botched assassination attempts earlier this year. Although it is unclear to what degree Himmler is supportive of such a plot, it is clear that he chooses to do nothing, despite being head of the entire Nazi German police force. Nevertheless, Goebbels is pleased to have gotten Himmler in charge, noting that no one would be better suited to define domestic policy than Himmler, probably hoping that a problem that he also described back in April after a conversation with the head of armament and war production, Albert Speer, can now be solved. Speer told me that the damage at Krupp after the previous to previous aerial attack on Essen have largely now been fixed. So one sees here that industrial damage is much easier to repair than the effect of damage to private houses. If Himmler can repair morale remains open, but Speer's efforts to keep the wheels rolling on the war industry remain unwavering and successful. After the attack on the V-2 rocket facilities last week and Hitler's formal support on the 22nd to use only victims of the concentration camps as expendable workforce on that program, Speer now proceeds to safeguard the production by moving it underground. It's the progression of work began earlier this year when the Ruhr came under attack. He has now moved large parts of war-critical industry to what he calls the new Ruhr spanning from Silesia southwards into Bavaria and the Austrian regions of Tyrol. As we saw this week and last week, that won't be far away enough from Great Britain anymore, a development that Speer has anticipated. In Silesia, he has already put to the industry's disposal some underground production facilities and disused stone quarries and mines. On August 28th, the first 106 slaves from the Buchenwald concentration camp arrive at a mine at the Kornstein Hill in the Harz Mountain Range. In the 1920s and early 30s, the IG Farben chemical and pharmaceutical conglomerate mined anhydrite for their paint production here. In 1936, the mine openings were enlarged to allow the entry of trucks and the safe storage of fuel in case of war. Earlier this summer, plans to turn it into an underground slave camp was drafted. This week, it is decided that this will be the new facility for Nazi rocket production, and the mines shall be expanded to house thousands of slaves, a construction effort that the newly arrived slaves will begin. It will receive the name Mittelbau Dora, and it will be a new low in the horrors of enslavement under the Nazi Reich. Already now, as expansion begins, the horror starts. Year-around, the cave system is cold and wet, with a constant temperature of 8 degrees Celsius, 46 degrees Fahrenheit. As usual in a Nazi camp, the food is hardly worthy of human consumption, and sanitation is non-existent, with the victims forced to relieve themselves in cleaved open oil barrels. The poorly dressed, unprotected construction crews will work around the clock in shifts, only to leave the caves once a week for roll call. Circumstances that will hardly change as the camp becomes operational. Otta Karlitomiski, an imprisoned Czech resistance operative transferred from Auschwitz to Buchenwald and then Dora, will remember. Our trip from Buchenwald lasted three hours and ended at the foot of a small mountain. 
We jumped out of the truck and fell in for the usual counting. High above us, a predatory bird circled, a buzzard. A hundred meters from where we were standing, a small gauge railroad ran into the mountain through what appeared to be a tunnel. The question we asked ourselves, however, was, where was the camp? There were no barracks to be seen, but only a few tents in which the SS were living. It was not long before we were driven at a run over sticks and stones directly through a pile of rocks onto the railroad tracks. In this way, we came to the tunnel entrance. At the entrance, there were two green houses, one for the watchmen, one for the SS guards. Again, we had a count of the prisoners that seemed to last forever. After a long time, we were led into the tunnel where a cold, wet breeze blew. The change from the light of day to the darkness of the tunnel was so sudden that we fell over the stones and bumps in the ground. Light in the tunnel was provisional. About every 100 meters, a strong lamp burned high in the ceiling. In the distance, about 300 meters ahead, the tunnel entered into a huge stone gallery. Here, our first surprise was waiting. On the right side was a gigantic factory hall, at least 30 meters high and about 300 meters long. Over the floor, lit by the red lights of carbide lamps, people were working like ants. Everywhere, from the tunnel ceiling to the walls, cold water was dripping, and it collected in huge puddles on the floor, where it had no possibility of being drained away. The SS watchmen showed no empathy for our astonishment and drove us further into the mountain. After about 50 meters, we found ourselves in a wide hall cut in a dome about 15 meters wide and 300 meters long. There were more and more halls cut into the walls at regularly spaced intervals. At first glance, it looked interesting, but it was still not clear to us where we were going to sleep after work. The answer waited for us in a further tunnel, where in the middle there was a pile of straw mattresses and a few blankets made of thin synthetic material. The SS watched these valuables, and after a while, divided them among us. Each one got an armful of wet straw, and every two prisoners a damp blanket. We Czechs held together, and so I shared a blanket with Iman Krejci. We spread the straw on the hard stone, lay as close together as we could, and after a time, like two cats, we went to sleep. I do not know how long we slept, for we needed it so badly. All of a sudden, in the middle of the night, there was an ear-shattering explosion that left us in a cloud of dust, and seconds later, a shower of stones fell on us. We thought an accident had happened, and we sprang from our straw. In our sleepiness and in the darkness, we bumped into one another helplessly. When the repetitious explosions finally came to an end, swearing broke out on all sides. The next moment, the SS were there with their dogs, screaming at us that we should shut up and go back to sleep. We had to obey. We could not sleep anymore. We were terrified of the next explosion and the possible consequences it could have. The next morning, a cry went out, get up, fast, fast. We got up quickly and wanted to wash off the dust, but there were not even a few drops of clean water to be found, only dirty puddles that we did not dare touch. So we went to work unwashed. In the first day, it did not particularly bother us, but after two weeks, we were so terribly dirty that it was almost impossible to stand it. The whole body itched terribly. We helped with the food so that we would get an extra portion of coffee, which was worthless anyway, with which we tried to wash ourselves. Our work commando was called cable laying and involved laying cables from the power source in the first of the tunnels in broad lines. It was a very tiring job and dirty, carried out in two shifts of 12 hours each. Death from hypothermia, disease, Cavens and exhaustion is a daily occurrence. The corpses are carted out in coal wagons on the small gauge track system, taken to Buchenwald and cremated, and a new worker takes the place of the fallen, who are by then a nameless heap of ash dispersed to the winds. At least 60,000 human beings will be enslaved here, and one in five will perish in the tunnels, countless more taken out to die after collapsing. There are only a fraction of the 12 million slaves who will work to keep the Nazi war supplied while the United Nations Alliance continues to bomb factories, cities, and human beings that have less and less to do with both the frontline war and the making of its technology. And so, in cavernous graves, the living dead will toil as witnesses to the terrible truth of fighting absolute ruthlessness. 
no matter how low you sink to fight a boundless monster, that monster will always find a way to go even deeper into depravity. If we follow them into the labyrinths of inhumanity, we are fighting on their ground, and while we might very well win the physical battle, we are at risk to forever lose our souls in the cold, inhospitable void that the monster leaves behind. If enter the monster's cave we must, we need bring the light of the principles of humanity, clad ourselves in the armor of lawfulness, and wield weapons forged in righteousness. Never forget.